Okay, first you want to go navigate to the Google Drive link that I have in the description. You want to download all the assets. I'm just going to import them in, just characters and tile sheet, and that's all we need. Now, these are Kenny's assets. He makes some awesome assets. All I did was upscale them because they were at super low resolution, and I just have them on the Google Drive. So definitely go check out Kenny. Now, you're going to want to select each of the textures and go to import and turn on mip maps. This basically tells it, so if we scale the sprite, it will dynamically set up the pixels. You know, it, it just make, it makes it look good if you resize the viewport or you zoom in the sprite and then we're going to also set this as the default for texture that way we don't have to keep setting that for the textures and just select the tile sheet and hit mip maps so all new textures will automatically turn that on next go to project project settings we're going to go to input map we're going to add some action so add right left up and down now right's going to use d left is going to use a up is going to use w and I, I think you guys know where i'm going wasd now i'm also going to use the arrow keys so right right arrow key and I'll just repeat this for all of the other keys okay so now that we have the input set up you can close that and we're actually gonna make in our script so right click and file system make a new script we're gonna call it global and we're gonna open the script we're gonna make a function called instance node it's gonna take a node in the parent now in this instance node we just make a node instance reference of the instance node then we tell the parent to add the child of the node instance and then we return it so we can access it later now we're gonna add another function above it this is gonna be instance node at location it'll take a node a parent and a location it will get a reference to the instance node using the node and parent arguments then it will tell the instance node global position to equal the location vector and return it so we can actually access it again so this is essentially just going to make everything easier when we instance nodes that way we can just say instance node at location next we're going to save global go to project project settings we're going to auto load we're going to auto load global that way we can access it in any script and just press add this will come in handy once we actually start instancing players. So save this. Now we're gonna add a new scene. We're gonna make this kinematic body to D. We're gonna name, rename this player, and then we're gonna add a sprite. Now in this sprite, you wanna drag in your characters.png. This will just be the entire sprite sheet of all the characters. And then turn on region enabled so we can select a certain one. And you can go in texture region and manually select yours. You can turn on snapping and say grid snap 256 by like, I don't know, 250. You can do this and select your character. Um, I actually just have the values right now. So I'm just gonna import what I used. I used 512 on the X, 1500 on the Y, 256 on the width and 250 on the height. And it's a little offset. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go offset and I'm just going to do 16 on the X and negative six on the Y. And then this will basically center it. Also, the sprite's a little big. So we're just going to make the scale 0 0.75, 0 0.75. Then we're going to add a collision shape. This is a kinematic body. We want collisions. We're going to set this shape to a capsule shape. And then for the radius, we want 40. And for the height, we want 33. And that's basically our hitbox. Next, we're going to add a tween and we're going to add a timer. Now we name this timer to network tick rate. And we're going to set this wait time to 0 0.03. And we can set the auto start now in the player we're gonna add a script just have it as player.gd then we're gonna select our timer connect the timeout signal back to the player and let's some let's define some variables above so i'm just gonna have a speed as a constant it's gonna equal 300 then i'm just gonna set up a velocity variable and i'm gonna get a reference to our tween in the process function we check if we are the network master i'll go over this later um we get an x input variable which is our right subtract our left key so it converts it from a boolean to an int so zero or one one being pressed zero being not pressed and subtracts it from the other one so if i press left and right they're going to equal one and one which is one minus one which is zero so cancel it out if i just do right it will just be one next i'm going to get the velocity which is just going to equal the x input y input normalize it i'm going to tell it to move and slide with our velocity multiplied by our speed and look at the mouse position now what network master means is Whenever I instance a networked object, I will always set the network master using an ID, which is your current go.tree unique ID, which is generated once you actually connect to the server or you create a server using a multiplayer enet. And this basically checks if we are the current player. So we'll be able to move around if we are the current player. If we are not, then we won't be able to move the other players because we're just controlling our certain player. So it'll compare the scene tree and then it'll say, okay, this player was instanced with the unique ID one five six seven so those match up which means we are the current player controlling this this just makes sure that we can't move enemy players around with our own inputs let's get into some of the network code so up here i'm going to import a puppet position variable that's just a puppet variable and it'll use the puppet position set puppet basically tells godot hey this is a variable that we're going to be changing over the network and i'm using a set get function so let's import our set get it basically so once we change our puppet position it gets the new value and it just updates it with the new value 
then we're just going to tell the tween to interpolate the global position to the puppet position. So essentially, let's say you receive packets like every 0.25 seconds. So there's going to be a space in between that frame where you don't receive a packet and the player will sit still and then he'll teleport to the next position. And that doesn't look that good because it looks like they're lagging and they are lagging, but we're going to try to compensate for that and make it look like they're not lagging by interpolating between those two positions. So it will just make it smoother and the players will jitter less when they're moving around. Now under the network tick rate, we just want to say if we are the current player that's being controlled, we want to send out our position variable. So this is basically saying change our puppet position variable and update it with my global position. That's basically what our set does. It will change the variable that you have as a string. It'll update that value with whatever value you have right here. And the reason why we're using unreliable method is this will send out packets way faster than the reliable method. Now unreliable means that we're going to actually be losing packets. So I could be sending out tons of packets and maybe like, let's just say 5% of the packets are lost, right? That would mean we have less data, but we are still sending packets at a rapid pace. It doesn't matter. If you do a one-time thing, let's say you try to buy something in a shop. You want to use our set because you want to make sure that packet is received on the client's end. Because if you use unreliable, there's a chance that packet won't make it. The reliable method will check if the client has received it, and if it hasn't, it'll just keep sending out packets uh, at a slow pace to make sure it actually receives it. Now, the data packets are not encrypted, so don't send login information over the network. If you're gonna do that, you're all gonna wanna use DTLS encryption. I won't get into that for now, we're just gonna be using unencrypted packets. Now, we wanna receive the rotation of the player because we're looking at the mouse position. So we wanna send out our rotation and we wanna have all the clients receive it. Now, to do so, we wanna do another puppet variable up here and we'll just have it at zero. Now under network master, just do else. So you're just gonna add this code. If we are not the current player, then our rotation degrees will interpolate the rotation degrees and it will interpolate to the puppet rotation value at delta multiplied by eight. I just did the delta so then it's consistent if the user end is lagging. It doesn't really matter. I just left that in there just in case. And this will make sure that the rotation will also be interpolated. The reason I'm not using tween is because we're actually gonna be checking on this tween to see if the player's moving or not later on. So that's why we're just going to be using the slurp right now. Now under the network tick rate, we just want to R set our puppet rotation with our rotation degrees value. So this is basically all you need, but I'm going to go take it the extra step. You're going to have unreliable connections when people play games. Like when you tell them you're going to play your online multiplayer game, they're going to expect the net code to be good and they're going to expect the experience for the networking to be good. Now I'm not going to be giving you the best net code because Obviously, I'm not an expert at this. I just learned this. And so I'll be giving you my best net code, but it's it's going to be far from the greatest. That being said, I'm going to take an extra step because I haven't seen the other tutorials do this. And we're going to take another step further in the lag compensation. So rather than just interpolating the position, we're actually going to define the puppet velocity variable and we're going to receive the last velocity. So this is almost like extrapolation where we're going to be guessing where the player is going to be next. So with this puppet velocity under this else statement, this is what we're going to be using for the velocity so when when we are not the current player and the tween is not active meaning the player is not moving to another position meaning a packet hasn't been sent we're not interpolating to the next position then we're going to say to move and slide the last received velocity variable at, at our current speed now the last thing that we have to do is we have to send out our velocity variable so just under network tick rate we're just going to put that there also we could technically throw this in the process function i just didn't do that because because there's not much reason to send 60 packets every second uh, because packets aren't going to defer that much. So I'm just going to keep it optimized. And I'm actually, that's why this value is like 0 0.03. So it'll send out a lot. It'll still send out the packets quickly. It just won't be that much packets compared to the 60 that you'd send every second. And for other networked objects, you can change the tick rate and make the wait time a bit longer just to optimize and prioritize certain objects over the networking but we're not gonna get into that. We're just gonna be using this value. So now we receive our last velocity. And if we are no longer, if we haven't received the next packet for our position, we aren't interpolating to the last position, then we're actually gonna start moving in the last recorded velocity. So if I was moving diagonally, let's say they haven't received in my next position packet in like a second, then my character will keep moving diagonally until it receives that next packet, then it'll correct its position. 
but this just takes the extra step in the lag compensation. So that's our player. We could save it, save this player.tscn, and we have all our entire player object done. Also, one more thing before we actually get in spawning in the players in the lobby, you want to go to network down here. And I actually, I screwed this up last episode. So I did the IP address begins with 192.168, right? But sometimes there's a virtual address like um, in virtual box or virtual machine that uses a dot one address. Uh, it'll be your device IP address, but it'll end in dot one, meaning it's a virtual address. And this will not work in our case. So make sure you do and not IP dot ends with dot one. This will make sure that we are actually actually getting a physical uh, Wi-Fi address and not a virtual one. Sorry, I left it out last episode. I screwed that up, but make sure you have that in here. All right, now we can get into lobby spawning. So go back to the network setup script. All right, so we're going to find what our player is up here. So at the top, so we're just going to get our player load player.tscn. Also, one more configuration thing before we actually start instancing players. I'm going to make a new scene. We're just going to make this a node, just a normal node, and we're going to call this node players. Now we're going to save this and just save it as players.tscn. Now I'll go project project settings auto load and auto load the players.tscn and we'll just name it player the reason why we're doing this is i actually i'm not going to destroy a player in this game i'm only going to destroy a player when they disconnect from the game this is going to make things a lot simpler so we're not constantly having to respawn in players in the lobby and all this other junk this will just make it simpler for us technically we can destroy the players i'm just going to make this easy and i'm just going to throw them into an auto loaded node that won't be set upon changing scene all right now we can go to network setup now we can define our instant Instance player function, it'll take an ID argument and it'll say player instance equals global dot instance node at location. Remember, we defined that at the start of this tutorial. And global will instance the player, which is right here, load player.tscn. And the parent is players, which is that auto loaded node right here. And that will make it so then the players don't get reset whenever we change a scene. Then we're just going to spawn in the players at a random value between 0 and 1920 and a random value between 0 and 1080, which is our basically our game size. So we'll just instance a player at a random location. Uh, we'll we'll set up spawn points later. That way players don't actually spawn on top of each other because they'll be colliding with each other. But for now, we'll just use randomness. Next, we're going to set our name to the ID that we instance our player at and set the network master at the ID, which will tell the player, hey, this is which client we belong on and this is the client that's controlling us. All right, and now all we need to do is go in this function player connected and say instance player and use that same ID argument that tells us the player with this ID has connected. We'll instance the player with that ID right here. And then when the player disconnects, we just want to destroy it. So we could just say, if we have that node and we search that ID. So if players, if this auto loaded node players, this auto loaded node players has this current player ID that we're looking for, then we'll get that player and we'll destroy it when they disconnect. Also on the create server, we're going to instance our player player because when we host the game we want our own player to be instance and we're just going to use the get tree dot network unique id that will basically return the id of our current network tree this will just return their network id which will be used to instance the player and so whenever a player gets whenever a player connects it instances a player whenever a player disconnects we just destroy a player and whenever we create the server we create our own player because the host wants to play too. Unless you're using a dedicated server system, then just don't worry about this line of code because you are not gonna want a dedicated server to have a player in. We need one more signal. So we're gonna do git tree. We're gonna need one more signal in the ready function. So we're gonna connect that. We'll tell the scene tree to connect connected to the server to ourself. And I'll just put this above the instance player method. And I'm just gonna call it function underscore connected to player. And then this is the connected to server function. And I'm going to tell it to yield 0.1 seconds. Now, this isn't this isn't a good solution in any way, but I just do this because the spawn location system will actually, you'll have to make sure that all the other players are spawned in or else the spawn location system might spawn this player at the wrong location. So I just made it so we wait 0.1 of a second and we're just going to instance our player. Once we connect to the server, it will instance a player for that, uh, for this client. So... So once a client connects to the server, it'll instance a player for that client. And whenever you host a server, it'll instance a player for you. And then it'll get all the other players that are connected and instance those. So that's everything. Now we can actually test the game. So let's start, let's run the game right here. Oh, also, I accidentally put the signal twice, the connected to the server. So just use, just use one. I forgot to uh, import the signal in here. 
So just make sure you only have this once and then you should just be able to run the game. Okay, so that's everything. And I'll just run another instance to go that. And if you ever see an error that's saying it can't connect because the port is not open or something in the output, you can just go to editor, editor settings, scroll down, go to network debug and just change the remote port. You can change it by one or down one, it doesn't matter. So I'm just gonna run the project and then we have in our window and I'll say, okay, I wanna create a server on this end. And then on this end, I'm just gonna enter the IP address, the server, which will be the same because we're on the same computer. And there you go. Our player has spawned in and they're able to move around. Our rotation is also transferred. Now I do have it so the rotation does stutter a bit. Like you'll see it flips around a lot and I'm going to look into that and see if I can fix that. So let's test it with the third client. Make sure it's able to spawn in all the other players that are already connected. And that client's right in. And you can see they collide with each other and they can move around. So I can exit out and the clients will disconnect. Now I'm just, I'm just gonna show you the lag compensation. If I go to the network tick rate I can artificially I can almost artificially introduce lag so let's say we're only going to send out this function every one second so this is very extreme in the latency and so this is a very extreme example of bad latency <laughs> and we'll see how our lag compensation system does so let's run and hit join server so now we got three players now this is one second delay so I'm going to move this player right here let's see I'm moving diagonal and I stop moving and you can see it corrected itself because it didn't receive that packet for a while. So it just kept moving in that direction, right? And so it's almost like it's creating more data, except it's just using the, reusing the old data and it's just gonna wait for the next packet. So without this lag compensation system, it would look a lot worse than this. He, he would just basically be teleporting. It, it, it looks a lot worse, right? <laughs> it's like the other one was still like unplayable, but now this is like literally unplayable. Like you cannot play this at all.